And uh, don't forget, there's three ways to support our ministry financially. Number one, we can use the Yay God boxes. Number two, we can use the online giving address that you see on the screen. And number three, we can send a check to the P.O. box. All three great ways to support the ministry. Make sure things keep going without a hitch. So mahalo for all of your generous support. Every single penny helps. Well, tonight is Just Jesus Week 76, Matthew Part 74. And last week, Jesus finished pronouncing what we call the seven woes on the Pharisees that he prophetically uh, judged them for their unrighteous behavior, their hypocritical behavior. And then Jesus prophetically predicted the destruction of the temple, which we know historically occurred in 70 AD. And at the same time, Jesus announced he would never visit that temple again. And that's true. He hasn't returned yet, and that temple's been destroyed. Uh, if he visits another temple, it'll have to be a rebuilding of the temple. And so we wrapped up by Jesus talking about his second coming. And he said that would be a time where everybody on earth would finally recognize and admit that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Even though they've denied him up to that point, everyone will see it clear as day when he returns. And so we said last week the disciples were a little confused by all of this, and they assumed that both the destruction of the temple and the second coming of Jesus were going to happen simultaneously. And so they pulled Jesus aside on the Mount of Olives and they asked him to give them some more specifics about what exactly are the signs of the end of the age going to be and exactly when is that going to happen. And so in response, Jesus sits down with them for quite a long period of time on the Mount of Olives and he delivers a long section of teaching that we know as the Olivet Discourse. So let's read that tonight. Matthew 24, verses 3 and 4 is where it starts. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so the sign of your coming, that's the question they ask. What, what's the sign? What's the visible, uh, predictive sign that these things are beginning to happen? And so that's the Greek word parousia. And parousia is often translated arrival or coming or advent. And we use that word advent uh, to refer to the visit of a king. So, for example, Jesus' birth is understood to be the first parousia or the first advent. We celebrate that at Christmas time, advent season, right? And so then his second advent or his second parousia, we know from our study of the Hebrew feast that that will come on a future feast of Yom Teruah, the feast of trumpets when the last trumpet sounds. And so Jesus spends two chapters answering this question, what will, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? As we said, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Now, remember, the disciples think Jesus is really just talking about imminent events, things that are going to happen any day now. But Jesus is actually mixing together some predictions, some of which will come to pass quickly, along with other predictions that won't find their ultimate fulfillment for thousands of years. And so even today, as we read it from all this uh, understanding, it can be tough to sort through it all. It requires a lot of CIE Bible study. And you'll see what I mean as we go along tonight. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, quote, they will say about themselves, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And so Jesus predicts that many false messiahs are going to come. And eventually we will see the ultimate false Christ appear on the screen, scene, the one that's called the Antichrist. We'll talk more about him later over the next couple of weeks as well. And so before, during, and well after Jesus' earthly ministry, many men did in fact arrive on the scene and falsely claim to be the messiah. And some of them were simply delusional, they were mentally ill, they maybe really believed their claims, they just weren't who they claimed to be. Others were probably sociopaths or psychopaths, scam artists who knew full well that they were lying about being the Messiah, but they made that claim to manipulate people to sort of create cults of personality. And then we know that the final one, this final false Christ, this false prophet, this antichrist, will essentially be possessed by the devil. He's going to truly try to make himself God. 
And even in our age, we've seen many cult leaders doing these things, making all kinds of supernatural claims about themselves. This has been happening down through the ages, and Jesus says it's going to keep on happening until he does finally return. And so Jesus also makes it clear in the verses to come that there's going to be no doubt about his actual return when that day comes. You know, if somebody says, hey, I I saw Jesus down at KTA, you know that's not true because he said it's going to be very obvious to the whole world when I finally return. So don't get fooled by human imposters in the meantime. That's his message. And when Jesus really comes back, it is going to be miraculously obvious to the entire planet at the same time. We'll hear about that more probably two weeks from now as we keep going through uh, these verses. So verse 6, Jesus says, here's what else is going to be happening. What's the sign of the age? What's the sign of the end of the age? When's this going to happen? Jesus says, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you are not frightened, for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end. So just like these false messiahs, there's going to be wars, There's going to be rumors of wars. That's been a constant part of the culture of our earth. Over the past 3,400 years, humans have only been entirely at peace for 268 of those 3,400 years. That's just 8% of human recorded written history that we haven't had at least some war going on somewhere. And at least 108 million people have been killed in the wars just of the last century, the 20th century. So Jesus makes clear, you know what, that's not going to change until my return either. Recently, we've seen Russia pushing all kinds of buttons on the border of Ukraine. Uh, That's just the conflict du jour. And it's not a war yet. It's just a rumor of a war, but it certainly fits with what Jesus is talking about. And we have numerous other hot spots on the earth right now. We always have and we always will have those kinds of conflicts, actual wars and rumors of war or threats of war. That's going to keep happening until Jesus' second parousia his second advent, his second coming, where he will finally come and win all wars for all time and permanently usher in peace. So then Jesus continues in verse 7. He says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. And again, these national conflicts, these wars, these skirmishes, these political, you know, back and forths, there's also going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes, we can lump in all kinds of other natural disasters, you know, floods and hurricanes and uh, tornado disasters like Kentucky had recently this year. All of those things have been occurring since the beginning of time. And Jesus says, you know what, they're going to continue, but they're going to increase. They're going to get stronger and they're going to get closer together. That's one of the signs that we're getting closer to the end time. And then he uses this curious expression. He says, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Okay? And so in Greek, Jesus says, these are the arche of Odin. That's what the beginning of birth pangs is. Arche means beginning or origin. And so he says, this is just the starting point. And while the King James translates the word Odin as sorrows, it actually literally refers to the severe pain of childbirth. Now, if you've ever been in labor or if you've ever observed someone in labor, you know that as that time of the actual birth approaches nearer and nearer, what happens? The contractions get bigger, the labor pains get bigger, and they get stronger, and they last longer, and they get closer and closer together without a break. That's the word picture Jesus is painting here about this worldly situation. So the closer we get to his second parousia, his second coming, his second advent, the more frequent and the more severe these signs that he's naming are going to become. We should see more and bigger cases of famine, drought, earthquakes, extreme weather situations, bigger societal conflicts. All of their intensity should increase. The length of time it takes to resolve them should increase. The recovery period should increase. And the more quickly one after another should begin to come. And so creation is basically breaking down. More and more it's just breaking down. And now of course there can be no doubt that this is exactly what we're seeing in the world today. There's more and more national conflict, there's more and more civil wars, there's more and more droughts, more and more famines, more and more ecological disasters of ever increasing frequency, scale, and impact. Now of course every generation looks at that situation and says, wow, 
I can't imagine it could possibly get much worse than this. So Jesus' return must be any day now, must be very soon. And yet with each generation, things somehow manage to get even worse for the next generation. And so we don't know for sure. We don't know when he's going to return. We don't know if we're close. It might still be many, many years before that happens. We don't know how much worse things can actually get. As bad as we think they can get, if you really stop and look at some third world situations and escalate that ten times and then make that the natural case of the entire world, we say, oh yeah, I guess things could get way worse than they actually are. And so the birth pangs continue, and then finally the birth, the arrival, the advent, the parousia, will occur someday in the future. And so Jesus just told us to be patient about this because these things the disciples were seeing at that time and to a certain degree, even what we're seeing now 2,000 years ago, could technically merely just be the beginning. We could be at the very beginning of this. The meltdown of our world is even now just getting started. And when the true end of the age comes, the violence, the destruction, the suffering is going to be unlike anything the world has ever seen to that point. And so Jesus makes a prediction that does begin to come to pass soon in the lives of the disciples, but again, with the caveat that eventually the persecution they're about to experience is going to be even worse than what they experience in the first couple of decades after Jesus' resurrection. He says in verse 9, Then they, the opponents of Christianity, the opponents of God, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And he says, And at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Now, this prediction, at least on one level, certainly begins to come to pass almost immediately because we know historically the disciples of Jesus were persecuted, they were arrested, they were imprisoned, they were tortured, they were martyred, they were hated by Jews and Gentiles alike, they were hated by all nations, just like Jesus said they would be. And some who became followers of Jesus, we know, eventually fell away from the faith because of that persecution. But this wasn't working out the way they thought it was going to be to walk with Jesus. And so they just went back to their old life. They fell away from the faith. The book of Hebrews and much of the book of Galatians are both addressing that situation in very interesting detail to some extent. And so here was the problem. For, for a lot of these people, when they became Christians and they heard Jesus is coming back soon, they thought that meant like any day, like next week, Jesus is coming back. And then when years began to pass, and then when decades began to pass, it became tougher and tougher and tougher to stick to their values, especially as they were being ostracized by their communities and sometimes even persecuted and killed. And so as these Christians were hiding out in catacombs and other kinds of places, former Christians who had fallen away began to sell them out. They began to betray them. They began to give them up to those who wanted to harm them. Now, again, that's been happening since the very beginning of Christianity, but that was merely the arche of Odin. It was just the beginning of birth pangs. And as we look at the world today, even now in many parts of the world, Christians are still persecuted. Christians are still martyred. Christians still get sold out by former family members who, who give them away to the people who want to harm them. That's still going on today. And so Jesus is saying as we go along to this future time of great tribulation, which hasn't begun, we uh, often see it called the great tribulation, the level of persecution during that time, the Bible is very clear, is going to be far worse than even the worst level of the early persecution of the church. And the more time passes, the stronger, the more wide-reaching that persecution is going to become. And when we really get to the end of this age, the evil and the hatred directed at Christians, it will be off the scale by that time. And again, Jesus' prediction is that for many who right now would claim to be a Christian... When death threats and persecution come their way, they may not be experiencing that, especially here in America right now. It's pretty, pretty easy to be a Christian. Somebody might say a nasty word to you once in a while, but there's no real physical threat typically to be a Christian. But if that begins to happen to us, Jesus says, you know, when those death threats and persecution come, many are going to fall away from the faith. They're going to reject Jesus. 
They're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit from their lives. They're going to return to sin. They're going to sell out their former Christian brothers and sisters. They're going to lie to themselves and say, I never really believed that anyway. And we know this has been happening for 2,000 years, but Jesus is clear it's eventually going to get much, much, much worse. And that's what Jesus is laying out for us. And he goes on in verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. In addition to those who claim to be a Messiah, others will arise who don't necessarily make the claim to be a Messiah, but they're willing to claim divine prophet status. And boy, false prophets, they've been around since the beginning of uh, time as well. But as we tick down closer and closer to the end, more and more are going to arise. More and more people will cease to know what Christianity really is, what Jesus really said, what the Bible really teaches. And we see that in, in our modern culture. There's all kinds of, you know, super famous evangelist kind of people on TV and other places who teach incredibly false things and build themselves up, really cults of personality again. And they're teaching and drawing people away from what the real truth is. And this has been happening, and it's still happening. And Jesus says eventually this is going to culminate in the person Revelation refers to as the false prophet, like the biggest, best false prophet of all, and the Antichrist that are both referred to in the book of Revelation. So Jesus is sort of foreshadowing that, and we'll get into that a little bit more specifically over the next couple of weeks. So Jesus really gives us a grim view of the future, right? And in verse 12, he says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Now, this word lawlessness is the Greek word anomia. Anomia, lawlessness, can be translated iniquity or disobedience or sin or an utter disregard for God's laws and God's morality. He says that kind of viewpoint is going to abound. And since God is love, and there is no true love without God, people's love for God, their love for one another, is going to grow cold because of their embracing of anomia, of lawlessness, of sinfulness, of iniquity, of disobedience. And so this is really a reference to their salvation as well. It's saying their love will grow cold. That's just kind of a euphemism for saying they're going to fall away from the faith. They're going to fall away from the truth. They're not going to love God anymore. They're no longer going to be interested in following and serving Jesus. So they're going to willfully hand back in their salvation status and say, I'm not a Christian anymore. I used to be a Christian, but I'm not a Christian anymore. Now, this has been happening you know, for years, like I say, and Jesus tells us this is not a brand new thing that's just going to happen in 2021, 2022. This has been going on since the beginning. But here's what I've noticed in the last year or so as I look at TikTok and I look at YouTube and all these other kind of social media feeds, there's been a surge in the last year of young people, especially people in their 20s, who are taking the time to create these whole channels about how they grew up in the church, they believed this, they were taught all this stuff their whole life, but now they say, I'm deconstructing Christianity, or I'm not a Christian anymore, and here's why, and they're really going out of their way to show that they used to be a Christian, and now they're not anymore. And Jesus would say their love has grown cold. They've become lawless. They've become disobedient. And so much more than in previous years. I've seen that in the last, in the last year. It's really been a swelling movement uh, in people who grew up in the church, and now they've decided, I don't believe it anymore. I'm no longer a Christian. They've fallen away from the faith. Now, how many believers, what percentage of believers is this going to happen to as the age, the end of the age ticks closer and closer? Now, listen, don't miss this. Listen, Jesus says that's going to happen to most that's what happens to most believers. He says most people's love for God will grow cold. Now that's a bone-chilling statement because we've seen him make similar statements many times before. He's told us the road that leads to destruction is broad and many are those who find it. And he says the, that it leads to destruction and the path that leads to salvation is narrow and few are those who find it. It's a constant caution for us to be alert about the current state of our relationship with God because it's way too easy to become complacent, to become deceived by false Christs, false prophets, false teachers, and it's really easy. It's never been easier to walk away 
from the faith. God wants us to stay till the end. He wants us to hang in there. He wants us to know the truth, but God's not going to force us to stay. We always have free will, and unfortunately, the Bible says this numerous times, many, most, will freely choose to fall away. Now, in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, we're told something very similar to what Jesus just said. The author of Hebrews says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. What's this passage saying? If we have been saved, if we have already been following Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we have been enlightened. We have once been enlightened, the author of Hebrews says. We have tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation. We have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit because we've been filled by the Holy Spirit when we became a follower of Jesus. We've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. All of these phrases being used by the author of Hebrews. He's saying, in other words, we are true blue, fully devoted followers of Jesus. But then the author of Hebrews shares a scenario where even true believers like this may choose to fall away from the faith and never again return to repentance. Now, I've shared this before. This is the equivalent of what Jesus refers to in in other parts of the Gospels as the unpardonable sin. There's only one sin that cannot be pardoned, cannot be brought back to repentance, and it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which my understanding, my interpretation of that is exactly what this author of Hebrews is describing, a person who has had the Holy Spirit inside of them, and then they've made the decision to eject the Holy Spirit from their life, to walk away from the faith. It's not about backsliding into sin. It's about a conscious choice to say, I am no longer following Jesus. I am no longer a Christian. I no longer want the Holy Spirit involved in my life. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So if we ever reach that point where our lawlessness increases to the point of our love for God growing cold, if we choose to fall away, if we blaspheme the Spirit, if we eject Him from our lives, the Bible says it is impossible then for that person to ever be renewed to repentance. They have sacrificed their salvation. Now, I know some denominations teach once saved, always saved, but, you know, Scripture is very, very clear, and Scripture is very, very consistent about this. It is 100% possible for a Christian to choose to fall away from the faith, to give up their salvation. And in fact, Jesus even says, this is what's going to happen to most of us, many of us will make this decision. Our love will grow cold. We will fall away from the faith. Being misled by false prophets or having our faith and our love for God persecuted right out of us is not only possible, it's actually the most likely scenario from what the New Testament says when this time of incredible persecution really comes to bear a lot of people are going to drop like flies in their commitment to God. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Don't don't get too complacent. Don't assume you're in like Flynn, right? You've got to really be cautious about how you live your life. And Jesus leaves no doubt about this when he concludes this point by saying this in verse 13. But... The one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, obviously, the flip side of that is true, right? The one who does not endure in the faith to the end will not be saved. So we've got to stand firm to the very end, willingly persevering persevering through all false teaching, all lawlessness, all persecution, even martyrdom. We've got to stand firm to the very end when Jesus finally does come again. Now, everyone, again, is always very concerned about, okay, but exactly when is Jesus coming back, right? That's what I want to know. When is the day? How long do I have to hold out before I get out of this situation? And that's what started the Olivet Discourse. That's what the disciples wanted to know. 
People try to set dates. People try to do mathematical calculations to guarantee Jesus is coming back on such and such a day and such and such a year. And I think a lot of that is driven by this unconscious need or maybe a conscious need to want to be able to quit, to want to be able to give up and not, not do the hard thing anymore. Can't I just you know get out of this? Do I have to keep standing firm? Isn't it time to relax yet? If I know I only have to hold on one more year, then okay, maybe I, I can tough out some persecution. But if you tell me I might have to wait 10 years or 20 years or the rest of my life, I, I'm less confident that I can stick with Jesus that long. And so Jesus tells the disciples when the end will come. They want to know when exactly are you coming back? When exactly is the end going to occur? And Jesus tells us in verse 14, he says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then, you want to know when the end's going to come? That's when the end will come. After this gospel of the kingdom has been preached in the whole world, as a testimony to all the nations. Now, in spite of how hard most of what we just read was to hear, I think this verse is the hardest one to hear of all. Because we say, when are you going to come back, Jesus? When are you going to defeat evil once and for all, Jesus? When are you going to end all pain, all suffering, all death, all sorrow? When are you going to create the new heaven and the new earth where we all get to live eternally with you and the Father and the Spirit in perfect peace and pleasure and joy for eternity? When's that going to happen? And Jesus says, when you share the gospel of the kingdom to the entire world as a testimony, that's when I will finally return and not until that happens when the gospel has been preached to the entire world then the end will come not before and so early followers of Jesus they were anxious for his return especially when the heavy persecution of Christians began to swell you know people were getting run through with swords and skinned alive and boiled in oil and burned at the stake and crucified and fed to lions i mean just horrible horrible stories you know in fox's book of martyrs you see all these incredible things and so many began to complain it's taken jesus too long you know we've been patient we've been putting up with this stuff but enough's enough and it had only been a few decades by that time but they're already this huge group of christians beginning to say we have made a mistake this is not working out. When is Jesus going to come? He is taking too long. And so that's the situation Peter's addressing in 2 Peter 3. And he's writing to those who want Jesus to come quickly because they're worried they won't be able to hold out much longer. They're worried they're going to fall away due to this persecution. And so Peter writes these words. He says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord... One day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Now, some people have taken this literally. We call them dispensationalists, uh, and they've worked out a whole thing. You know, the earth's 6,000 years, and the 1,000-year millennium, and, you know, every day, one's a day, and it's a week, and they've got this whole kind of system. I, I don't go that far. I think it's simply a poetic way of saying huge spans of time are nothing to the God who lives outside of time and space. And so what feels like a thousand years to us is a very short wait from God's perspective. And so then Peter follows up with that, and he says, listen, the Lord is not slow about his promise to return. He said, I'm coming back quickly. I'm coming back soon. He's, he's not, he, didn't, he, kept that, he hasn't broken that promise. He says, as some count slowness, he, he's not being slow. He is being patient toward you. Why? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Instead, he wants everyone to come to repentance. And so he's trying to give everyone as long as possible to share the gospel with all nations so that everyone who hasn't heard the gospel yet actually gets a chance to hear it and therefore actually gets a chance to respond favorably to it and they actually get to be saved as well. So with all the complaints being made about Jesus taking too long in his returning, Peter wants us to know the delay is for your benefit. The delay is for the benefit of human beings. God wants to wait as long as he possibly can for as many people as possible to repent of their sins and come to faith. Because once he puts that end times judgment thing into motion, 
things get really bad really quickly and really unexpectedly, and then it's too late for the people who have rejected up to that point, who have never heard at that point. There's no chance at that point. And so look at verse 10. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This is what Peter says. Uh, you know, you don't know when a thief's going to show up. He doesn't send you a text, say, hey, I'm getting ready to come rob you, right? He just surprises you. That's what he means. So the day of the Lord's going to come very surprisingly, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And we see this in other parts of Scripture. You know, God destroyed the earth with a flood in Noah's time. The next time God wipes out this broken earth will be with fire. It will be burned away completely. And then God creates a new heaven and a new earth. So once this starts, this judgment, this end time starts, everyone's chance to get right with God is over. They missed the boat. And so Peter has some very strong advice, very strong words for us as followers of Jesus. He says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, what's that therefore, therefore? All that stuff we just talked about, how when the end times come, God's going to destroy everything that's been in existence now and create something new because of all that. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, what should you be doing? Be diligent to be found by him when that day comes, to not have fallen away, to not have uh, given up on the faith. Be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. And he says, just as also our beloved brother Paul, he's talking about Paul the Apostle, right? According to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. He's talking about the same stuff. Peter's talking about it. Jesus is talking about it. Paul's talking about it. The Bible's consistent. In which uh, are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort. So again, we're back to the false teachers and the false prophets and the false messiahs, and they prey upon people who have not sufficiently understood and studied the scriptures for themselves, and so they teach lies that sound just like truth, and they lead many astray from the faith. That's what he's talking about. There are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort as they also do the rest of the scriptures and they do it to their own destruction. He's saying God knows what these false teachers are doing and they're going to have to pay for that sinfulness. So Peter refers to the untaught, the unstable people, many of whom started off as kind of carnal believers. You know, they liked what this Jesus thing sounded like. They said, okay, I'll be a follower of Jesus. But then they never changed their lifestyle. They continued to live in sin. And they ended up distorting the true meaning of scriptures to justify the lifestyle they were living. And he says, by doing that, they have pushed themselves toward judgment. They push themselves toward destruction. Or as Jesus put it earlier tonight, their lawlessness has increased and their love for God has grown cold. And so then Peter concludes this section by saying in verse 17, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, what should you do? Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Don't let that happen to you. Don't fall away. Don't let your love grow cold, right? Jesus, Peter, Paul, all talking about the same thing. People are going to walk away from their salvation. The Bible's consistent. Peter says in verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what you should do intently, daily, be consistent about this, stand firm, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do that, you will be able to stand when the day of persecution comes. And he says, to him, to Jesus, be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So put this all together. What's it saying? We need to stand firm. We need to be on guard. 
We need to not allow ourselves to be deceived. We need to not be one of the untaught or the unprincipled. We need to be not one of the unstabled. We need to study the scriptures. We need to know the scriptures so that when a false teacher begins to teach us something that's not true, we recognize it and we don't get caught away in their wave of deceit. Don't let yourself fall away from the faith and miss out on salvation. Endure to the very end. And also, if we really want to hasten his return as much as possible, well, Jesus told us exactly how to do that. Go share the gospel with everyone. The faster we share the gospel with the whole world, the sooner Jesus will return and usher in this eternal paradise that we all desire. So how intent, how focused, how successful are we as the church being in sharing the gospel with the entire world? Remember, Jesus' final words before he ascended was to give us the Great Commission. We're going to read that and study that in depth about five, six Sundays or five, six Wednesdays from now. And so, again, Jesus isn't being slow in his return. He's given us a mission, and he's waiting for us to fulfill the mission. He's waiting for the gospel to be shared to the entire world, to all nations. And when everyone has had a chance to hear it, when everyone can say they've heard it and they've either rejected it or they've received it, when everyone's had the chance to be saved, then the end will come. That's as fair a deal. That is as fair a deal as God could possibly offer. And still, knowing that, though, here's what we know from from church growth experts who who do all these kinds of surveys and and polls. 99% of Christians, 99% of Christians have never shared their faith with one other non-Christian person. The world is not being evangelized. The gospel is not being shared with the whole world. And therefore, the world is not being saved. And it's because the church isn't doing our job. We are still here only to help fulfill the Great Commission. But we're just not doing a very good job of it. And when we refuse to share our faith... We're responsible for making Jesus' return take longer than it needs to. That's, that's kind of on us to a degree. Our delay in spreading the gospel is directly responsible for many people caving in on their faith because they've been faced with deceptive teachings and persecutions. And they've held on to their faith as long as they can, as well as they can, but they're just running out of time and they're running out of energy and they're running out of perseverance. So the disciples, they want a date from Jesus. Tell us when you're coming back. October 26th, what's the date, Jesus? When are you coming back? When will all these prophecies you're discussing with us right now, when are they going to be fulfilled? And let's continue in the Olivet Discourse. Jesus begins to give some very specific signs that we know now won't ultimately be fulfilled for thousands of years, at least 2,000 years, after Jesus makes these predictions, we're still waiting. And all indications are some of these signs may take several more generations at least before they finally come to pass. And so in verse 15, Jesus says, Therefore, because of all that stuff we've already talked about, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Okay, that's the lead-in. And then Matthew puts a little editor's note in here. Let the reader understand. So, what is the abomination of desolation that was spoken of through Daniel the prophet that was standing in the holy place? That's the question we have to answer before we can go on with this, right? Now, I could easily write an entire four-part sermon series on this one verse of Scripture and still not completely cover all the angles that come with this. This is a very loaded statement by Jesus. And many scholars and many interpreters are at severe odds about all that is implied and stated here by this verse. And so we don't have nearly enough time uh, to tackle this tonight. So I'm going to push this off until next week. 
and then we're going to give it some significant study. We might might spend the entire message on that one verse next week. We'll see how it, how it goes. I'll, I'll just get us as far with it as I can. I don't want to give you a whole seminary course about that one verse, but we want to give it some significant time. So I'm going to encourage you, do a little study of your own this week. Read it for yourself. See what you come up with. Maybe look online, see what other kinds of uh, content that you can find referring to it. What is Jesus referring to? in Matthew 24, 15, and really all the way through verse 21, that whole section. And that's what we're going to try and cover, those, those six verses. That's what we're going to try and get through next week. So our takeaway tonight, though, is simply this. When we ask Jesus, what signs can we look for and feel like we are able to nail down when exactly your second coming is going to happen, or at least be able to confidently say, it's coming soon. It's coming this week, or it's coming next month, or it's coming next year at least. We can narrow it down that far. His answers seem to indicate we, we can't be that specific. We can't be too specific. He will say later we'll be able to recognize the season of his return, whatever that means, but we still won't know the day or the week with certainty. And some prophetic things have already been fulfilled but many others still need to be fulfilled before all the prophecies about his return make sense. And right now, we don't see a clear path forward for some of the things that to happen anytime soon. You know, there's some, we'll talk about this a little bit next week. There's an uh, assumption, a belief that the temple will need to be rebuilt before Jesus comes again, that there needs to be a third temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem before Jesus returns. Well, there's a Muslim Dome of the Rock on there right now. So you think about what in the world would have to happen for the dome of the, uh, the mosque to be removed and the new temple rebuilt. That's not going to happen anytime soon, right? That's a huge kind of thing. And so there's a lot of things that need to happen according to certain interpretations that aren't going to happen anytime soon. So when's Jesus coming back? It could be soon. We could be misinterpreting something, but odds are it may still be a while. Things may get much, much, much worse before Jesus returns. And so I think Paul gives us kind of a great summary of how we're going to wrap it up tonight. A great summary from Paul about how we should respond to tonight's message. And it comes in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 11. Paul says, Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Because he's, again, talking about when's the end going to come? When's Jesus returning? What's the exact time? People are asking that question all the time. He says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. We just read that, you know, before. And while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child. Jesus has told us that. And they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. You're not unaware. You are spiritually alert to what Jesus is doing and what's happening in the world. And that, and th that, that day would overtake you like a thief. You know better. You should be able to see the signs when you get close. You should recognize the season, and you should be absolutely ready for the return of Jesus when it finally comes. He says, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. We're spiritually enlightened. We're partakers of the word, right? And so let us not sleep, spiritually sleep, ignoring the truth as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us stand firm and let us be aware and make sure we get what God is saying all the time. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober." Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We just talked about that from Ephesians the last couple Sundays, right? For God has not destined us for wrath. He doesn't want us to go to hell. He doesn't want us to be eternally separated from him. That's not his plan or his hope for any human beings. His desire, his destiny for us, what he desires for all human beings, is for us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, because of all of that, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you also are doing. And that's part of that share the faith with everyone 
uh, who isn't a Christian yet, but it also has this idea of looking out for each other. And when you see a brother or sister begin to stumble in their faith, begin to struggle with believing, beginning to say, maybe I'm not a Christian and maybe I don't believe this anymore. What should we do? We should be encouraging one another and we should be building each other up and not letting each other fall away from the faith. And he says, you've been doing that, but man, you need to really commit to doing it because it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher as time goes by. Stand firm. Don't fall away. Stay ready. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this message from Jesus. Uh, It's one of those wake-up call kind of messages that we can get really complacent in our faith and think that You know, it's just easy to be a Christian and to just do the right things and we don't have to really study the word anymore and we don't have to learn anything new. We forget that being a follower of Jesus is a lifelong journey. Every single time I read a scripture, I maybe have read it a thousand times before, and yet the thousand and first time I read it, you show me something new, God, that I never saw before. There's never a moment where we arrive as a Christian, and then arrive in our knowledge of who you are and what your word has to say. It's so much deeper than we are. It takes an entire lifetime of intense study and commitment, walking in faith with you. And if we get complacent, if we get sloppy, and if we start to let other people define what your word says, if they're lawless people, if they're false people, They can pull us away from the truth. And if we allow that to happen enough, it is possible, even likely, many, perhaps even most, their love will grow cold and they'll fall away from the faith. We don't ever want that to happen to us. And so we hear again and again and again and again and again in Scripture that we need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to stand firm. We need to stand strong. We need to stay sober. We need to be intent about making sure we stay firmly, fully devoted followers of Jesus. I pray that tonight would just be that wake-up call for all of us who hear this tonight to stop and just say, how am I doing with that? How intent am I? How committed am I? How careful am I to make sure I don't get pulled away into falsehoods and make sure that I stay on the right track with Jesus. God, help me stand firm and help me do what Paul said at the very end here as we look around and see our other brothers and sisters. If somebody else seems to be struggling in that way, help us encourage them and help us build them up. And then, God, this last part is so challenging. The Great Commission Jesus has given us his mission to evangelize the world, and yet the church has really failed spectacularly on that. There's so many people who have never yet had an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus, or they've heard a distorted view of it and think they've heard it, so they've dismissed it. We as a church need to become so much more intent about taking every opportunity to share our faith with everyone we can, with everyone we meet. I pray that you would convict us all tonight to be much more intentional about that so that we can bring about the new world, the new heaven, the new earth of peace and joy. No more death, no more pain, no more sin, no more sadness, no more struggle, no more grief. The way it was all supposed to be before sin entered the world. That's what we're fighting for. That's what we're looking forward to. Help us stand firm until the very end. That's my prayer for all of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.